Well, Professor Denim, thank you very much for allowing with this interview once again. I know it's, it's the it's the second time we we speak. We have already uh, met each other a few years ago. So, as this is my first time making an interview in English, uh, just will try to speak um, a little slower and make my best efforts to avoid any major mistakes. So, in any case, I apologize for you and for my um, and to the listeners for my not so good English. It's better, um, than my, better than my Portuguese, but I'm very happy to speak with you again. Thank you, Maria. Well, thank you. So to start, I mean, as I've already read your book and we already talked about it, considering the audience who may still want to read it, I'd like to begin a conversation with the premises of your book. I'm not going to ask you why liberalism failed, of course. I'll let them find out. But I'd like to know um, what vision of liberalism you reject And what is your definition of freedom? Well, so uh, I guess the, the book in many ways begins with uh, an argument that and the claim that um, liberalism is a philosophy that is several hundred years old that um, takes a very old, takes a very old um, idea, takes a very old concept, the concept of freedom. The concept of freedom is very ancient. It long precedes the philosophy of liberalism. You find it articulated and discussed in the ancient Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy, Roman law. Of course, in Christianity, we hear Jesus and St. Paul speaking of the freedom of the Christian. And in the long tradition of the Middle Ages into the early modern period, we hear many discussions about the nature of freedom. And at the heart of those um, discussions and understanding is, is an idea that freedom is a condition of self-rule. It's a condition of self-government uh, and self-governance, both in the personal individual sense uh, in which we rule ourselves and we rule our passions and our appetites, uh, but also as a political community that you're free above all when you are a self-governing political order. Um, and so this means that you need um, fairly extensive um, institutions and practices that cultivate the arts of self-rule, the arts of self-government. And these, of course, include something as formal and as political as the law and a legal order that um, teaches us limits and teaches us how to, how to govern our appetites. And it also includes all of the more informal institutions that um, you could say are the are the responsible for this kind of teaching. Of course, the family, um, church, uh, religion, uh, schools, universities, and so mm -hmm. forth. There's smaller institutions that should um, help people to self-govern. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of these are directed in this by this older understanding of freedom. All of these are oriented to the cultivation of this form of freedom that requires above all the cultivation of virtue. And so you'll mm -hmm. always see in the classical Christian tradition, you'll see extensive discussion of what, what is virtue and how is virtue cultivated? How is it formed? How is it developed? Uh, and that, that, this is, that this is not a condition of um, being oppressed. It's not a condition of, of of some kind of unjust limitation on our freedom. It's, it's the precondition for a genuine kind of freedom. Uh, now, what, what liberalism inaugurates, it, it, as I argue in the book and elsewhere, liberalism changes the definition of, of freedom and of liberty, even as it keeps the word. So it looks like it's the same thing because it has the same word. But in fact, it's defined in essentially the opposite respect. It's defined as a condition in which we are free to do as we wish. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want. Yeah, uh, uh, everything other than that which harms someone else. That's really the only limitation on freedom, right? And it, mm -hmm. if you ask just the average person today, uh, just you know, go up to someone and say, what do you think freedom is? This is how they will typically define it. Freedom is the is the... It's the condition in which I can do what I want as long as no one is being hurt. No one is being Yes, hurt. they'll say that your freedom ends when someone others starts. Right. Something like right. that. 
And so this is the definition you, of course, famously encounter in the thought of John Stuart Mill mm -hmm. uh, in his book on liberty. This is really what liberty is. Liberty is the freedom to do as you wish so long as no one is harmed. And only when someone is harmed can you, um, you know, uh, institute limit freedom. Kind of yeah, you can limit freedom legally, socially, or otherwise. Uh, uh, but um, this is also the freedom that's defined in the earliest works of the liberal tradition. So if we think about the social contract tradition, uh, which you know is something used by Thomas Hobbes and something used by John Locke. John Locke is the, considered to be the father of liberalism. Freedom is defined in the state of nature in exactly these terms. Freedom is the, is the condition in which you can do as you wish. You can dispose of your person and of your property without limitation, without, um, without any kind of limit. And so what, what we really need to notice is that uh, while it looks like there's a continuity between the ancient understanding of freedom and the modern understanding of freedom, because both traditions value freedom, both conditions mm -hmm. believe that freedom is a good thing. Mm -hmm. They define them in fundamentally different ways. And one of the consequences of this, and this, this moves us to the discussion of why liberalism failed. Mm -hmm. One of the consequences of this is, this is that all those institutions that we were just talking about um, that have been seen as essential to cultivating the virtue that a free person um, needs to, to properly enjoy their freedom, so beginning with the family, of course, and schools and universities and religion and the broader community and, of course, law and the, and the legal institutions of a, of, a, of, a, of a society and a political order. All of these institutions now come to be seen as oppressive and mm -hmm. as limits on our genuine freedom. Under the new definition of freedom, all of those institutions which were necessary for freedom now become the opposite. And they either have to be overturned or redefined. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we think about what we see in the world today, the redefinition of the family, of course, the redefinition of religion, the redefinition of what a university is, what, a, what an education is, uh, and of course, the redefinition of law and politics, all of those have been redefined effectively to conform to this new understanding of freedom. Mm -hmm. It's all about expanding your personal freedom and nothing about, or almost nothing about learning how to govern yourself, how to deal with your own desires and your own limitations. So, well, the next question will be um, to, a, to go to a more, to a broader uh, idea of liberalism. When we spoke for the first time back in 2020, I asked you how the world has changed since the release, since the release of uh, Why Liberalism Failed in 2018. You said that today we've seen alternatives to liberalism emerging, especially in new forms of Marxism and conservatism. So almost two years have passed and the world has really uh, changed a lot. We have new world leaders, we have a view, we have, I'm sorry, we have a new big war going. Um, we have new, a whole new post-COVID world to deal with. So do you believe that these alternatives to liberalism will get stronger? And as we don't have much time today, I'm going to put this question together with another one, which is we currently have two major illiberal forces in the East, which are Russia and China. They have very different profiles. But we have seen some conservatives, influencers or even leaders, um, Viktor Orban is the first that comes to my mind, who support um, Vladimir Putin, for example. Actually, uh, there's less, there is less support of the Chinese government, but uh, I have seen, personally, I have seen also some conservatives praising CCP as well as a more legitimate form of government, a government that... Uh, according to them, will be more driven to the common good instead of this um, form of freedom that's all about personal freedom, uh, as we've seen in the West, despite all the widely known practice of torture, persecution and all. So I'd like to hear your views on that, I mean, on these alternatives to liberalism that are emerging in the world, 
if they're going to get stronger in this future that we're building right now, and specifically about these two uh, non-liberal or illiberal forces. Yeah, I mean, it's just, we could talk for a long time about these, yeah. these topics for sure. Um, I guess I would I would want to draw some distinctions and some important distinctions. I think, of course, you're correct that there are certainly some people in the non-liberal, anti-liberal camp that have been drawn to either Russia or aspects of Russia or or China as as providing examples or providing alternatives to the liberal order. Uh, and and I think that, but I, I, I tend to think that that's a little bit of, a, uh, of an exception to the rule in the sense that there's very few people that I can think of that are sort of actively saying the West or the United States should look like Russia or the West or the United States should look like China. I, I think it's more, are there practices? Are there um, examples of um, the regime that, uh, that can be helpful in thinking about our own society. But I think that I think the country you mentioned where there's the most interest uh, and where I think you see the most enthusiasm among conservatives is Hungary. Uh, mm -hmm. is the example of um, in a number of different areas, the example that's been provided by Viktor Orban through a set of very impressive electoral victories in Hungary and a willingness to use political power in ways that um, more conservative figures in the, in the United States or the West are unwilling to use political power. And I'll just give you an example of a couple of things where I think you find much more interest in a place like Hungary, which is a European country. It has a long tradition as a, you know, as a Western nation it's much more recognizable to people in the West and, and, and has a lot more, you could say, in common with, with uh, countries of the West than a country obviously like China or even a country like Russia. So I think, I think to the extent you want to say that there's an attraction among a sort of anti-liberal conservative element in foreign examples, the country that comes quickest to mind would be Hungary. And, I, and I'll, I'll point to at least two areas um, where I think this is the case. The first mm -hmm. of these is the willingness to use political power to secure and advance cultural values. Uh, that that there's, um, in, in the United States, for example, conservatives have tended to be of the view that culture is in some ways autonomous from law and that you promote good culture, but you don't use or turn to the law and to politics and to political power to encourage or cultivate um, culture. I think the willingness of, of Orban to, um, to use political power, especially to, in his view, uh, combat what have been hostile elements uh, in the universities, in the Hungarian universities. So gender ideology programs, things that now are leading to transgender ideology in our, you know, in our, in our part of the world. The place from which some of the most radical kinds of ideologies have been emerging, uh, you know, critical race studies, um, critical, I mean, the kinds of, again, transgender and uh, gender ideology studies. These are now mainstream. Uh, in the United mm -hmm. States today. Uh, the, and they were all banned in Hungary. And, and in Hungary, they were effectively defunded and they were, mm -hmm. um, they were basically shut down in, in universities that are state universities, right? These are state-run universities. They're funded by the state. And the state said, these are not values that we want to promote in our country. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also been an effort uh, to create a kind of... Uh, especially through something like the um, what's called the MCC, the Martinez Corbinas uh, Collegium, uh, mm -hmm. effort to institute um, forms of education and cultural exchange that at, its, at, at their core uh, really highlight um, conservative 
what are Hungarian, but also European and even uh, transnational kinds of values. And I've been a visitor at that institution, and I can only speak very highly of, of, mm-hmm. of the kinds of activities that they're undertaking. It's not a, uh, a, a form of, um, you know, just a, a top down, you know, enforced viewpoints. There's a lot of questioning and a lot of exploration, but it takes place within a broader context of conservative values. Mm-hmm. The, se- the second main area, if you look at Hungarian policy, the second main area has been a real emphasis on family policy. And this is another area where traditionally kind of conservative liberals or liberal conservatives in, in the United States have been unwilling to use the power of the, of the federal government or of state governments to support family formation, to support marriage, to support children, uh, to support young parents, and to use taxpayer money to use the federal purse um, to say this is a value of our country. And I think uh, Hungary, which is now spending 6% of their federal budget on family policies, policies to support family formation, uh, marriages, uh, families with children. Um, I think it's really been a positive example. And you're beginning to see in the United States, you're beginning to see more and more uh, Republican politicians beginning to uh, uh, adopt and embrace the idea that this is, this is something that we need to do. So I do think that that um, there's a way in which um, conservatives in the West have been learning things from outside of um, outside of the sort of the let's say the the usual powers, the United States or the you know Germany, France, uh, and so forth. But it's really tended to be more the Eastern European countries, Poland and Hungary. Uh, than mm-hmm. looking to China and Russia as the sort of exemplars of what we what we should be looking at. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, there are two questions that come that that uh, come from this part of the conversation. Um, but you just mentioned the use of political power to uh, you said not impose, but to propose or to to um, finance so, uh, a certain view, a specific view on culture and and this and and. and of course, the family. And you and your colleagues who defend post-liberalism are often accused for this reason of being authoritarian. They're also often related to Catholic integralism. I'm sure that you have heard this, this expression. So I'd like just to, to know what you have to say about these accusations and what is the limit of the post-liberal state that you just defended. I mean, what is the limit of this, the, the, the kind of state that you are proposing that can use the political power to, to uh, invest in culture or in family and this kind of stuff? Where, how, where does it get authoritarian? Mm-hmm. So, well, there, there are actually two very different questions there. Yeah. So uh, very briefly on the question of Russia and China, um, I do think, as I as I indicated already, it's probably um, there are certain limits to what can be valuably adopted in a Western context from cultures that are very different. I mean, I think you have, uh, you know, we were just talking about Hungary. Hungary is a it's a country that has a I think I think the you know the religious traditions of these places and let's just say the cultural traditions that arise from those religious traditions there are certain deep similarities that make for example it it make it more difficult to simply transfer or translate something from an orthodox christian tradition into a western christian tradition or from a confucian tradition mm-hmm. into a western tradition now, but that said, um, I think, for example, um, when I look at um, China's willingness to expend substantial sums of money uh, and public, a kind of public support for uh, p- substantial investments in infrastructure, in the Chinese infrastructure. Now, admittedly, China is starting from a point way behind where we are in the West. They're building out a new modern infrastructure. They have an advantage in that way. They're not stuck with a decaying infrastructure from the 19th century like the United States is. Mm -hmm. But the United States is kind of right now content with living with a 19th century, a decaying 19th century infrastructure. 
And that has a lot to do with opposition to any public expenditure that comes from so-called conservatives or libertarians. They're mm -hmm. unwilling to say that, uh, you know, the, the investment of public funds to improve the public infrastructure is a public good and will benefit the country over the long term in the same way these investments did in the 19th century. Now, some of the heroes of, of today's conservatives, Alexander Hamilton and Abraham Lincoln, they believed in these kinds of expenditures, but you never really hear about that when, uh, when you encounter uh, arguments from libertarians. So, so I do think that, um, you know, in some limited ways, there are, you know, there are, there are things you can at least look at and admire about other countries without saying we can make ourselves or be or sort of just align ourselves or, or become those countries. Because I, I think there mm -hmm. are always going to be limits. And this is one of the things that a respect for distinctive cultures and mm -hmm. distinctive histories has to be cognizant of. To your, I mean, to the, to the more, what I see as the, 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 the really challenging question, of course, of um, is there not a danger of authoritarianism when it yes. comes to uh, a call for the exercise of public power. I, I guess just two things. There, there's no society that doesn't have, that doesn't exercise authority in some way. There's no political order that can avoid the exercise of authority. And so the question becomes what, you know, what, for what end and what purpose will authority be exercised? And, you know, we now live in a Western order that now is increasingly governed by people who have no hesitation exercising authority for ends that they desire. And this is the kind of progressive left today, right? Which wants a world in which the family has been reordered, in which the universities and the schools have been reordered, in which a, a vision of human sexuality as a kind of form of self-expression and self-identity, self-making becomes primary. And the response to that isn't that, oh, we can, the response to that uh, by some is that, well, if we can eliminate expressions of authority, uh, we'll all be free. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what, what I think the left understands is that their definition of freedom, right, which is, it's the extension of the liberal definition of freedom, this idea of being able to do whatever you want. Well, it turns out that that expression of freedom requires authority. Because it requires you to disassemble institutions that human beings have built over many centuries, right? The disassembling of religion, the disassembling of family, and that requires extensive authority. Now, if your response to that, which would be my response, is that, well, no, we don't want, we don't want that form of freedom. We want a form of freedom in which we understand ourselves to be self-governing. Well, that also requires a form of authority. We just talked about this, right? It requ yes. requires authority that um, is invested in the, in the cultivation of virtue, right? mm -hmm. uh, in the cultivation of a virtuous human being who learns and uh, develops the capacity to be self-governing. Now, that, that's also a form of authority. Now, here I would say that in, in the modern liberal understanding of freedom, there's no limit to authoritarianism. And this is the irony. The claim that we can be completely free also requires the greatest exercise of political authority imaginable. Because what it means is that you have to, you have to force, in some sense, you have to force the freedom, the liberation of people from everything that might limit them. Right. Mm -hmm. and so this includes, of course, every relationship with every other human person, including, of course, the most natural human relationships of parents and children. And one of the ultimate aims, I think, is to turn the reproduction of children into a, basically a kind of scientific act to free women and to free men from the biological limits of their bodies. That's really mm -hmm. the, the ultimate trajectory. And if you don't think that that's going to involve a lot of authoritarianism, then I have a surprise for you. So, so what you're saying uh, is that basically the liberal order that pretends not to be authoritarian in the end course, ends up being authoritarian. Not just authoritarian, but authoritarian without limit. Mm -hmm. It becomes tyrannical. It becomes despotic. It, uh -huh. it is a despotic society. Now, 
the definition of freedom that we started with, the classical and biblical definition, also requires authority, but it's a limited authority. And it's mm -hmm. limited because it's based on a knowable and definable good of human beings. Right? It's what, we, what Aristotle would call our telos, what, what Aquinas mm -hmm. would call our telos. You, we don't make the telos. Human beings don't get to create the telos. That's given. Mm -hmm. That's created by God. It's, it's part of our nature. It's, it's something that we don't change. What limits government under this understanding of freedom and what limits authority is, of course, the limits of our own nature or the limits of the created order itself. It's the only way to limit political authority. You don't limit political authority by creating checks and balances. This is not how you, you know, does anyone think the liberal political order is limited because of checks and balances? I mean, you just have to read the newspaper to recognize that's not the case. What, mm -hmm. What's the only genuine limit to political power and political authority is a definition of the good that we don't make and that a proper and just political order is oriented to and limited by. And I think mm -hmm. this is where some of our mutual friends who call themselves conservative liberals or classical liberals have really mis misunderstood, it seems to me, one of the deepest and most profound teachings of the classical tradition, which is that mm -hmm. limited government comes from limited ends that government is oriented to and by. Okay, um, how much time do you have so that I can, like like two more questions. Do you think yeah. we can make it? Yeah, two more. Yeah. Okay then. So uh, speaking on religion, uh, a few days ago I made an interview with Tom Holland, not Spider Man Tom Holland, but the the British historian yeah, right. about his book Dominion that has just uh, been published in Brazil for the first time. Right. Is it also with your the press? What is it also with the same press or no? No, it's a no? different publisher. Oh, too bad. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, a great, well, a great book. Yeah, it's a great book, mm -hmm. and the central idea. Actually, I, I actually I read your your article to Post Liberal Order. I follow Post Liberal Order on Substack, so I read your article on the pessimism on the left. The left, and the central idea of the book, as you know. If, and if I understood it correctly, is precisely the fact that all the main liberal institutions that we care so much about in the West are actually inherited from Christianity. So liberals should recognize this tradition instead of simply dismissing Christianity as most of them actually nowadays do. So we can mention, for example, the very understanding of what is religious or secular that you know way better than me that comes from St. Augustine and even the idea of multiculturalism. But on the other hand, in your book, you question some of these uh, liberal institutions. So if it's true that they are all inherited from Christianity and from a tradition, what went wrong in this way? And should these institutions, these liberal institutions, be um, dismantled or reformed what should we do to them? How should we deal with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I have a, you know, there's one part of me that's, that's um, very revolutionary. Um, I want to have a, you know, as, as our conversation suggests, I would like for us to have a very different, a fundamentally different political order. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I'm a counter-revolutionary and I'm responding to a revolution that occurred 500 years ago or so, and has been proceeding over the course of several centuries. And when I argue that liberalism has failed, it wasn't immediate. It wasn't like the day after John Locke wrote the second treatise of government, we didn't see liberalism failing. It didn't exist yet. It's failing today because it's becoming true, because it's, succeed because it's succeeding, because mm -hmm. its basic fundamental premises are becoming real in the world. And what we see, I think what the, the evidence that we can see all around us is that no human society can be genuinely well-ordered if it is based upon a false idea of freedom. You know, it's just, it's, it's just patently obvious uh, that we have fundamentally misunderstood the nature of freedom in the, in the modern world. So 
I'm I'm a I'm a revolutionary, but a counter-revolutionary because I want for us to re sort of readopt and define anew. And it's not just a going back, it's a going forward, but thinking in the context of modern times, how does one take that classical understanding of freedom with all of the changes we've experienced? You know, it's not like going back to ancient Greece. I don't think any of us want to do that. But um, it's a matter of how do we live in a world in which we have so many temptations for limitlessness? And how do mm -hmm. we learn mutually, politically, educationally, religiously, familially, socially, how do we learn the lessons of what it is to be a human being ordered to the good with all of the manifold, uh, often very deep and problematic tendencies we find, for example, with techno modern technology, mm -hmm. uh, the, the great temptations to believe that we are limitless. So we have great challenges, but we have some really important answers that we need to rediscover and then refit and repropose for a very different time. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this way, I think we actually don't need, even though the ideas in a sense are revolutionary, the institutions that we have in their oldest form were originally designed for the, that original understanding of liberty. Mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I work in a university and it's pretty funny because my university, like a lot of universities, has really, really old looking buildings. Right? Even mm -hmm. the newest buildings at the University of Notre Dame look like they were built in the Middle Ages. So we still have this kind of inherent value that these institutions, literally in the form of the building, are informed by this older philosophy. When in fact, they're informed by the new definition of liberty. So mm -hmm. in my view, it's not a terribly difficult thing in some ways to repopulate these institutions with the original ideas, now updated, redefined, but mm -hmm. to repopulate them. And in this way, while it's revolutionary, it doesn't require, literally, it doesn't require a revolution. It doesn't mm -hmm. require to overthrow the government of the United States or to mm -hmm. fundamentally change the institutions of the government or to fundamentally overthrow the universities. Or like using the force tomorrow to end up these authoritarian uh, 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 attempts from the left. Yeah, and, and, but I think, I think one of the things that the authoritarian left has awoken many conservatives to is that the idea that you can somehow escape the exercise of political power is really, that's, that's dead. I think that, mm -hmm. is, that was a that was an idea that arose during the Cold War, and it was in response to fears of the Soviet Union. But that's mm -hmm. now dead, I think, in the United States. And you mm -hmm. see it. You see it now, for example, in the governorship of Ron DeSantis in Florida, who did something that you know no gov no Republican governor would have done in the last fifty years, which is that he stood up to a corporation, and he forced them through politics to change their policy. This was when mm -hmm. he stood up to Walt Disney, you know, one of the mm -hmm. most powerful corporations in the United States. So he used the office and the power of the political order to restrain the, the commercial order, the economic mm -hmm. order. Now, mm -hmm. if you hang out with the people up in Grand Rapids uh, in the Acton Institute and other right liberals, they will tell you that the political order shouldn't intervene in the economic order. The economic order is autonomous and should be left free of you know, political interventions into the mm -hmm. marketplace. But I think this was really one of the most significant uh, political acts of the last 50 years because you had a very significant, potentially a future uh, political leader, pr future president of the United States, quite possibly, willing to use political power to intervene uh, and to restrain and restrict the economic activities uh, of, uh, of a very powerful corporation. Uh, and I think this is going to be something that more and more uh, conservatives are going to be looking at very seriously, especially as they're faced with what we call now woke, woke capitalism. Okay. Well, the last question would be, um, we mentioned the left, and in Latin America we are witnessing 
the emergence of a new wave of governments on the left after an era of governments that at least in speech, uh, not necessarily on practice, but claim to be committed both to the market and to conservative values. So I'd like to see, I'd like to know, how do you evaluate this new wave? And I ask this because of course, most of conservatives are already think, talking about the return of populism. And the last time we spoke, you told me that you believe, and I think, and I found it very interesting that populism is often the nickname given by the intellectual elites to the results that they don't like. Um, and of course, as I said, uh, conservatives in Latin America are now scared and are all talking about the return of populism. So what is the role of, how do you see this new wave that's coming for Latin America? Uh, maybe because uh, the support of free market has failed in here. I mean, sometimes it feels to me that he has, that, that, that that's what happened. And, uh, and also, what is the role of Latin America and Brazil in the, con in the construction of this post-liberal order that you propose? Yeah, this is uh, it's, it's, it's sort of extremely interesting because at the very time that it seemed to me that uh, there was in the United States an, an, a reaction in our electorate, in our voting public, people by people who consider themselves to be conservative. I'm not talking about the conservative leadership and the elites. I'm talking about the sort of every man, the kind of average citizen. And those people who consider themselves to be conservative or at, at some level were not on the left, ended up repudiating the entire free market system that had been erected by several generations, especially of elite conservative politicians uh, and policymakers. So it, in the aftermath of World War II and during the Cold War, as you know, as you well know, there was a very extensive effort to develop a free market conservative ideology that you know, saw its culmination in the presidency of Ronald Reagan uh, the ascension of figures like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek and the kind of libertarian, the Chicago boys, right, who become very influential in Chile. Yeah, we uh, heard about them a lot. <laughs> of course. So in other words, the election of Donald Trump, but already before Donald Trump, right, this was already happening 20 years before Donald Trump. And it was, these were in, it taken, they took the form of populist insurgent opposition, to the Republican elites. This was the, the first in the candidacy of, of Patrick Buchanan back in the early 90s, and then in the candidacy of uh, Ross Perot in the middle and latter part of the 1990s, and then the victory of Donald Trump, of course, in 2016. This was, he was running against, not just against the Democrats, he was running against the elite of the Republican Party. And he was running in particular against this free market set of ideologies that had become dominant in the Republican Party. Notice what Donald Trump ran on, right? Stronger borders, uh, t uh, forms of economic protectionism, um, mm -hmm. and a decrease of the expansion of the glow of forms of globalization, right? Uh, an effort to build domestic industries to protect American workers and an American, uh, American industrial, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, economy. So at the very moment that you had a kind of, let's just say, a right-wing populism that emerged in the United States, you had, as you just said, you had a whole series of political figures in, in, the, in the southern part of the Americas, South America, Latin America, mm -hmm. in which the, the, the conservatives thought, let's combine free market ideology and conservative values. Let's do the things that the Americans had done back in the 1960s that the American right had begun to build in the 1960s. If anything, you should have been looking at America and saying, guess what? That doesn't work because, <laughs> because it turns mm -hmm. out that a free market ideology is not supportive of conservative values, right? The things that people need to conserve a stable and orderly way of life are not provided by a globalist economic ethos. Right. It's too disruptive. It's too disordering. 
uh, it ends up undoing the kinds, the forms of stability that people need, the expectation of a relatively predictable future that people mm -hmm. need in various communities. Uh, it may mean that you're not going to be as dynamic, wealthy, prosperous a society, but you can be reasonably prosperous and not buy into a kind of, again, a free market ideology. So, so here's my, without having a deep knowledge of each country, and I don't have a deep knowledge of Brazil, though, if you can arrange an invitation sometime, I would love to come and, and learn. That would be, that would be, well, well let's, let's make it happen. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's my very brief um, and uneduca uneducated sense of things. Places like Brazil and Chile and others, I've been to Chile a few times, had an opportunity to develop a different way of thinking about what conservatism is, especially given what they should have been learning, what not to do that the United States had done. Right? The election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump should have been a very serious uh, indicator of what not to do. Um, mm -hmm. Don't pursue policies that are that try to combine a kind of social conservatism and an economic libertarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't do that, I'm sorry, if, if, you, if you don't avoid that, then guess what? Then you're likely to have left populism as a result. And especially because left populism is such a longer, deeper tradition, obviously a Marxist tradition uh, in, in South and Central America, it's very easy for people to say, okay, we're gonna go with the people who seem to be want to, wanting to protect the worker. Yes, so, that, is a, that is a widely known view that many of these leaders in Latin America, especially in Brazil, were elected not because their views on economics, but on other issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I think that one of the things that's desperately needed, um, and this is why I mentioned Hungary earlier, there are real, there are real lessons that we stand to learn in the kind of conservative world that we stand to learn internationally. Uh, that it seems to me that the left has been very good at generating a kind of global network of exchange of ideas of of how and w in what ways different national circumstances um, have called forth different responses. Progressives have a lot of organizations and a lot of institutions. And conservatives have been actually very bad at this, it seems to me, uh, mm -hmm. at developing forms of exchange um, that really could be helpful and beneficial across national boundaries. I know more of them, and I think more of them are being developed, especially between the United States and Europe, but it would be really valuable uh, to develop these as well in the Americas, in our hemisphere. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that um, I certainly think because of especially, you know, uh, a certain, certain amount of shared cultural, uh, obviously Christian, um, in, in my case, Catholic, uh, Catholic background, and at a place like Notre Dame, we should be in the forefront of this, uh, but that there would be really valuable uh, opportunities uh, for exchange of ideas um, and best practices um, mm -hmm. that, that I think uh, we have not been particularly good at. Mm -hmm. Well, Professor Denim, of course, we're not here to discuss whether I agree or not with all your views, so it's not my role. Yeah. And actually, I think I should have to study a lot before um, trying to, to have a real debate, but I think they're very interesting, at least as a provocation. Um, so I would say, and I, at least I can say that I agree with the view that in Brazil, we are Actually, we try. We do. We did try to buy a form of conservatism that was that was made for United States or to England. It's not. Uh, sorry, are you listening? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, you just. The, I I lost you for a yeah, few seconds. Either my camera or your camera froze. So I don't know what happened. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was saying that in Brazil, we, I I agree that we try to 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 copy and, and to create a kind of conservative movement that was fit for the United States and for Europe, but not for our own tradition. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is really recognizable here. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as I was just saying, I also think it turns out that the conservatism that was developed 
uh, it during and after the Cold War in the United States has turned out also not to be especially well-fitting uh, mm -hmm. in the American context. And I think had a lot to do, um, especially with the desires of corporate America uh, that uh, really drove the funding and the creation of the institutions of modern American conservatism. Mm -hmm. But as, as it turns out, these were not um, ultimately extremely helpful for the American worker. And to the extent mm -hmm. that conservatism is always going to draw the bulk of its support from the kind of working classes, uh, from the people who really do rely on uh, a way of life that's conservative, uh, that, uh, that there's been a real divorce between the conservatism of the institutions of the elites and the conservatism of, of sort of average people. So I, I, I think, again, um, mm -hmm. the United States... Uh, is is probably we're in desperate need of of um, rethinking of these kinds of issues, and we can certainly not just um, seek to teach others from our experience, but also to learn. Um, it seems to me we need to be a little bit more humble uh, mm -hmm. and to be and to be open and willing to learn from the experience of other places as well. Okay, um, Professor Denim, thank you very much for your time once again. Thank, thank you My for pleasure. these second conversations. I think we, we, we can I mean, talk about all these issues for hours. Yeah, Maybe we have an opportunity in Brazil I as would, soon as possible. Yeah, I would love that. I've never been to Brazil, but uh, uh, I feel like uh, uh, it, we, we'd have a lot to talk about. So thank you again for it was nice speaking with you again. And thanks for thank you very much. See you. Okay, bye bye.